One of the things that our family likes to do in the summer is go to the pool. Anybody like to go to the pool in the summer? Some of you, some of you not so much, I don't know. (laughs) We have a small pool in our backyard, but as much as we can, we try to get to some of the local pools. And so last summer we were introduced to Prophetstown Aquatic Center. That's a great place to go, put some fun water slides there. Uh, But what we wanted to do this summer is, is help Nate because somewhere along the way he'd kind of developed some fears. Uh, If you don't know our family's history, we'd spent some years overseas, and when we took Nate to Africa when he was one, he's now 10, um, he, like every other child I know, pretty much grew up pretty fearless, you know, do anything. Uh, But somewhere along the way, he kind of developed some fears, and so we felt like we need to help him address some of those things, and and one of those is he had no desire to go down the water slides. We felt like, well, this is is an easy thing to address, not so much, it took much convincing, Um, but eventually we did help Nate, so we were there about a month ago. And we talked him into it, and he worked up the, the bravery to go down. And so he went down the water slide, and, and it, he was a little bit emotional about it, but he got down to the bottom. And I said, so now, was that so bad? We're like, no. You know, was it a lot that we were pushing you a little bit? He's like, but I'm ready to do some more. So, like, he was all in, you know? And that's how it is. You know, he finally had a desire to do water slides and realized how much fun that could be. Uh, but much more than we want to help our kids move past fears more than we want them to have a desire to go down water slides, although that can be fun, we really want our kids to have a desire for Jesus in their life. Uh, that's what we want to foster. And of course, we talked about that this morning as we dedicate children to the Lord. You know, but we, we are born with desires. And some of those are God-given, some of those are not. Uh, you know, some of you this morning, maybe you have a desire for a new car. Maybe you're not real happy with the job that you're in, you desire a new job. You know, we're, we're given lots of desires, but what we find is, as we examine and continue in Luke this morning, that God desires for us that what he wants of us is that we would desire more of him. Desiring God, John Piper uh, is kind of head up that ministry, but I love their tagline. It says that God is most glorified with you as you are most satisfied with him. And that is true. So we're going to continue in Luke chapter 5 today. So if you have your Bibles, I hope you do, <laughs> hope you do have a Bible. If you don't, there's a Bible underneath your chair. There's one underneath the chair in front of you, maybe. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that one home as a gift from us to you. We want everyone to have a Bible. Uh, but we're going to be in Luke chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. I'm also going to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word today. Just simply out of reverence for the fact that God gave his word to us. Thank God for that so that we could understand better how we can live and live the best life that's possible in his name. So we're going to be reading Luke chapter 5, verses 33 to 39. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so did the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, And then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And the one who puts new wine into old wineskins, sorry, no one puts uh, new wine into old wineskins. But if he does, the new wine will burst from the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skin will be destroyed but new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. But no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. These are the very words of God. You may be seated this morning. So we're walking through the New Testament book of Luke, and we're in a section under the heading of Follow Me. And we started in that section where Jesus is on the shoreline. He asks Peter, Simon Peter, if he could take him out into the water so that he can teach a crowd that's there on the banks of the Galilee. And he takes him out, and while he's out there, he invites uh, the disciples that are there, they're fishermen. He tells them, although you've caught nothing last night, throw out a net, and you'll bring in a great catch. And they do it, and they bring in this phenomenal catch. But he doesn't end there. He says, you know, you've been catching fish, but follow me, and I'll make you catchers of men. You'll be a part of setting people free. You'll, You'll catch people for the sake of releasing them, liberating them. And then immediately from that passage, they do it. So they go out, and there's a leprous man. He comes and engages with Jesus, and, and this leprous person, an outsider by all standards, is invited into the kingdom of God because no one is outside of the kingdom of God. 
Everyone has an invitation. He heals him, and then he heals this paralytic man. And the, the crowd that's there, they said, we've seen extraordinary things today. And what we find is they experienced the extraordinary because they were a part of bringing their friend to Jesus. And we have that same invitation. We can experience an extraordinary life as we bring people to Jesus. And then last week, as we continued through Luke, we saw that as Jesus left from this house where he healed the paralytic, that he goes out, he sees Levi, the tax collector, and he invites him. Levi knew what was happening in that town, knew what was happening in that house, the house that was packed of people, but Levi didn't show up there. In other words, Jesus walked out and he saw somebody that was not going to come unless he received an invitation. And he invited him to follow me, and he did it. And one of the things we find within those scriptures, Peter, as a fisherman, he had a good job. He had a good income. Levi had a great job. He had a great income. But both of these guys understood, more important than the provision this world has to offer, I want to follow the King of Kings, the Son of the living God. And they gave up everything, and they followed Jesus. And now in this passage this morning, where we're at is we're still in that banquet, so Levi's still holding this party with his friends, and they, they get the question, they ask Jesus, why do your disciples not fast? So although we know we have this invitation to follow Jesus, we know that we experience the extraordinary by bringing people to him, we started last week to look at how we follow Jesus. So if you've accepted the invitation, it's nice to have some instructions on how we do that. And we're going to continue in that today with our passage as we get further explanation on how we follow Jesus. And the first way is this, that we follow Jesus by desiring more of him. We follow Jesus by desiring more of him. Some of the guests at Levi's dinner party, so they ask him, why do your disciples not fast? And fasting in Judaism was a major rite of piety. Uh, they would fast at least one day a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where they were asking God to atone for their sins. But we also see later in Luke, as we continue, we'll find that the Pharisees would fast two days a week. And fasting, what they were doing when they were fasting is they were mourning or they were seeking deliverance. So fasting for a Jew was to mourn or to seek deliverance. And this is why Jesus brings up a wedding. So he walks through these metaphors to explain why his disciples in that moment were not fasting. Jesus responds to the question about fasting, and he talks about a wedding. And here's what he says. A, a wedding, we know, is a symbol. This is what we find in the Old Testament used to describe God's relationship with his people. We find this in several books, in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So when Jesus brings up a wedding, this was not an unknown metaphor. We see this in other places in the Old Testament. And considering the groom, Jesus, is what he's saying, I'm present, so there's no need to mourn because I'm here, and they don't need deliverance because I'm the deliverer. So that's why we don't need to fast right now. But now when Jesus has gone away, he says, then his disciples will fast. So basically, fasting is a way of expressing our longing for our bridegroom, Jesus, to come. So Jesus isn't here with us in body. He's risen. He's ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father. It says in Scripture that he intercedes for you and I. Praise God, he does that. So, But now that he's gone, when we fast today, what that's saying is, Jesus, we long for your return. How many long for the return of Jesus? Amen. May he come back and establish his kingdom. That's what we do when we fast. So one of the meanings of Christian fasting is we're expressing our desire for Jesus to return and take up his kingship. That's what we're asking for. And what sets New Testament fasting apart as unique is, is new wine that can't fit into old wineskins. This is part of what Jesus is talking about. So this kind of fasting is unique. We'll come to that in a minute. Is that Jesus has already come. Jesus has already been here. He's already established a down payment to show that he will return again one day. Why? Because he's already been here. And so we love him. We've tasted of his presence. And so when we fast today, what we're saying is, Jesus, we're not satisfied with the world as it is. We want you. We want your presence. We want your kingship on this earth. That's the Lord's prayer. Lord, your kingdom come. Your will be done. So when we fast, it's the way that we express, Jesus, we desire your kingdom to be established here. But the incredible thing as we fast is that we already know that he's been here. We've tasted of his presence. It's that taste and see and know that he's good. 
So we've already tasted of Jesus, and now we're saying, but we want more. We're not satisfied with the taste that we've had. You know, that's part of what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who have an insatiable desire for more of Jesus. We should be starving for more of him. But unfortunately, what we find is we're going to continue in some of these metaphors is it seems some people are satisfied with maybe a single piece of that bread. But what Jesus is saying, you should desire the whole loaf. Are you satisfied with where you're at with Jesus? Or are you desiring of more of him? So fasting expresses more than a longing for Jesus and a hunger for his presence. It's a hunger that's rooted in and based on an already present experience reality of Jesus in history and in our hearts. That's the joy of fasting. We already know him. We see him in our hearts. If you've experienced Jesus, if you've given your life to him, you've experienced his presence prayerfully today as you were singing, you had a sense of who Jesus was. And so when we fast, we're saying, but we want more. My soul ever longs for more. So how do we follow Jesus? We follow him by fasting because we want more of him. I mean, Jesus lets us know that we should fast. He says in this scripture, they will fast in those days. We are living in those days. So I encourage you, if you've not made fasting a part of your Christian disciplines, you know, maybe you've been good to do Bible reading, maybe you've been good to spend time in prayer, but could I challenge you? Could you take it a step further and maybe commit some time to fasting? We did that earlier this year as a church. We asked if we could commit to 21 days of prayer and fasting, and people did that in different ways. And so I encourage you, find uh, a time where you can maybe fast. Shelly and I, when we were early on in marriage, Uh, We'd only been married a couple of years. We felt like the Lord was leading us to a place where we would give up Wednesday lunchtime and fast. And so we did that. And basically we were saying, Jesus, we want more of you. And more than that, we want your kingship, your kingdom to be established in our lives so that we're continually following after you. And so we did that. But don't just fast from food. In other words, don't just skip out on a meal. What you should do when you fast is you should feast on God. Fasting from food is meant to be feasting on God. Don't miss that part. So on Wednesdays as we were fasting, it wasn't just that I skipped out on that lunchtime. It's that I didn't take that time to eat so I could have more time for Bible study, more time for reading God's word, more time for prayer. When you fast from food, you're meant to feast on God. And that's how we express our desire for more of him. We're saying, God, fill us with more of yourself. More than I need food, I need you, God. So do you want more of God? Then take time to fast from food in order to feast on Jesus. Skip a meal. Spend a couple of days, if that's what the Lord would lead you to, so that you could express your desire that you want more of God in your life. How do you follow Jesus? You take time to fast, expressing a desire for more of him. And the second way we find in our scripture this morning is that we follow him by making him our all. We follow Jesus by making him our all. So after Jesus talks about a wedding... He turns his attention to garments. And here's what he says. He says, No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. So Jesus understands how clothes work. If you take a new garment and and an old garment and you take a new piece and try to patch it with that new piece of cloth, when you go to wash that clothing... That new piece is going to shrink, and it's going to cause that garment to tear. So what Jesus is saying is, if you've simply taken a piece of what it means to live in the kingdom of God, and you try to add it to your old life, it's just not going to fit. You can't do that. So when a person accepts the invitation to follow Jesus, what they find is there are things that they used to do that no longer fit in the kingdom of God. We all have those things in our lives. There's things that are God-centered, and there's things that are not. If a person accepts the invitation to follow Jesus and they simply try to tear off a piece of Christianity and apply it to their lives, guess what? It's not going to work. It's not going to patch that old cloth. You need more than a patch. You need a new garment. I know a lot of people who come to church because they know there's something missing from their lives. And God gives us that, by the way. If you don't know God, if you don't have a relationship with him, there is something missing from your life. Our soul longs to be reconnected with its creator. Our soul truly is restless until it rests in Jesus. 
So God gives us that desire. Why? Because he wants you for himself. As we sang this morning, he wants you to be a child of God. But yet so many people, they they come into a church setting and their idea is I'm simply going to add Jesus to my life. So how do I do that? I'll drop a dollar in the offering bucket because, you know, that seems like a good Christian thing to do. I I might read a scripture a day like some people have their screensavers. Do you have screensavers today? I don't know. Yes? No? And I I need an answer. I actually don't know. Are there screensavers today? Like that's kind of an old technology. I don't know why that came to mind. But they, they populate their screens or maybe they've got a calendar with a scripture a day. You know, this is, so they take a part of Christianity for their lives, but they really don't center their lives on God. That's not the way that we're meant to live in Jesus. We're not meant to just take a patch. We're meant to take on a whole new wardrobe. Who we are in Jesus is meant to look very different than what our old garment was. And this is what Jesus is trying to talk about here. It's what's inside that counts. External activity is not the issue. It's not about going through certain religious exercises or just attending church. God longs for a heart that celebrates his presence. He longs for a heart that has a desire to serve others. Uh, it was about a, a month or two ago, I was visiting with a, a gentleman, and we were talking about church, and he was, he was relating to me. He said, you know, I really love Jesus. I love his teachings. And, and we were talking through some different things. And he asked the question, so if I want to become a member of your church, do I need to become a Christian? And I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, so I shared with him, number one, everyone is welcome at church, but yes, to become a member, we would want to know that you're following after Jesus because that's what this community is all about. We want to follow Jesus. So I said, yeah, you need to become a Christian. He said, oh, well, I can't do that because I'm a Hindu. So the issue was he was happy to add Jesus to his life, happy to add the worship of Jesus to the list of many gods that he worships, but he wasn't ready to give him exclusive rights. What we find in scripture is following Jesus is an exclusive act. We find this in John, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one can come to the Father but by me. Some people are bothered by that statement. But I would say, thank God he gave us the direction of how we get to the Father. Now the question is, are we willing to surrender to him so that we can have entrance into the kingdom of God? Hinduism is not the way. Islam is is not the way. Secularism is not the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and he is life. I encourage you this morning, if you've not surrendered your life to him, may you make that decision today. Jesus desires to give you life, but you have to receive that invitation to follow him. Have you given your life over to Jesus? Are there areas in your life that you're holding back? Maybe you've only added Jesus to your life. You've really not replaced the garment that you're meant to wear. Is staying up late at night watching TV more important than getting up early to spend time with Jesus? How have you oriented your life? How have you oriented your days? Is going out and getting drunk with friends more appealing than exhibiting self-control and being a witness to that group of people? Don't just add Jesus to your life. Read the words that are written in this book and start to apply them to your life. God desires his best for you, and it's laid out in this book, but you have to surrender to him to receive it. Follow Jesus with everything that you are and then experience a life that only he can bring. Following Jesus is making him your all. The last point this morning is that in following Jesus, you do that by embracing your new life in him. You follow Jesus by embracing your new life in him. What we have, the third metaphor this morning, is one of wineskins. And it says, Jesus tells them, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one after drinking the old desires the new, for he says, the old is good. So the picture we have here is they would take sheepskins and goatskins, and after they would remove the hair and prep the hide, That hide, you can actually look this up on Google, they take the entire skin and they put the wine in the neck and they seal it up. But what Jesus is saying is, is you can't put that uh, new wine into old wineskins. Why? Because those old wineskins don't have the ability to stretch. So, Because what happens is that new wine, it begins to ferment. And if that skin can't stretch, then that skin bursts and everything is spilled out. So what is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about our new life in him. If you try to take the new life that Jesus gives you 
and he begins to develop things in your life, but you still try to hold on to the old life that you have, it's just not going to work. It's going to burst open and everything is lost. So the only way that we can experience the new life that we can have in him as he begins to ferment in our life, begins to develop the fruit of the Spirit in our life, every night we pray over our kids, Holy Spirit, ferment in their life. Give them more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the qualities as you make and accept that invitation to follow Jesus, God begins to work and sow these things into your life. But the way that you do that is you fully embrace that and you don't try to hold on to that which is old. But here's the problem. We find from our passage this morning that many people revert back to old ways of living because they think ultimately they can live without God in their lives. I love the way the New Living Translation puts this verse. Here's what it says. That very last verse in verse 39. The old is just fine. How many people do you know in your life? They're, they really have not committed their lives to God, and they hold to that. The old is just fine. You know, one of the greatest challenges to Christianity today in our culture is comfort. The media may want to say that the greatest threat to Christianity today is Islam, but that's simply not true. One of the greatest threats to the life in Christ today is comfort, security, all of those things which would say, I don't need God. One of the things, if you've gone to our global prayer night, there's a prayer guide in your back seat. And on one of the last pages, there's 12 kingdom prayers. And one of those kingdom prayers prays specifically for people to have a conviction of sin. If people don't feel the weight of their sin, if they don't understand their lostness, they don't understand their need of a Savior. As part of your prayer time, as you take time to pray and pray over our community, which I pray you do, um, I would ask that you pray for that. Pray for the conviction of sin to be evident in people's lives so that they understand their need of a Savior. Everyone in this room, it says, as we look at Romans, Paul walks us through these things, that all have sinned. We all are sinners in need of a Savior. And it says that even the wages of sin are death, but praise God, he doesn't leave us there. What we find with God, he says I, that I gave your only begotten son. I sent you my son so that you might live in eternity with me. Praise God for that. We don't have to live a sinful life. We get to live free from our sin because Jesus came. So the question is this morning, as we look at how we can embrace and fully embrace our new life in him, how do we do that? This goes back to our core values. We haven't visited them for a while. We're in a Sunday night connect group, it's a high adventure connect group, and we're walking through these core values, and we have them reading biographies of Christian heroes. Because one of the things that you find for those people who have truly changed the world is they exhibit these five things. That's why I wore my t-shirt this morning. They exhibit the quality of abiding daily. They daily spent time with Jesus. They spent time reading his word, and they spent time in prayer. Where we get the scripture for that is John 15, 4. It says, abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't know anybody, I I have met very few people that would say, I want to do nothing in my life. I I haven't met those people. Because then we find in Paul's words, he says, in Christ, all things are possible. I can do all things through Jesus who gives me strength. That's the promise we have in him. So we challenge people, abide daily to embrace the life that you have in Jesus. Abide daily. The second thing is live the word. And how do you live the word? You love God, you love others, and you make disciples. Because if you love God and you love others, you'll want them to be made disciples. It's really, really simple. And here's a scripture for that. It's in Mark. He says in Mark 12, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you embrace this life in Christ by abiding daily and living the word. And you also do that by sharing the story of Jesus. And we found in our scripture passage in Follow Me that we experience the extraordinary life that Jesus promises by bringing people to him. And here's the scripture, Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with us as we do this work. Last week, we had two baptisms. Weren't those incredible? I love water baptism day. So we are fulfilling that scripture as we engage and encourage people toward water baptism. So you embrace this life in Jesus by abiding daily, living the word, sharing the story of Jesus, and by giving generously. Shelly took up the offering this morning and talked about how we can be a part of giving generously. God gave generously, so we simply mirror what he did by doing that. And here's the scripture. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, Paul writing to the Corinthian church about the Philippian believers. And they gave beyond their means. How do they do that? Through supernatural means. Jesus uses people who are committed to his purposes, and he gives through them. That's the way it works. And the last one is serve others. How do we fully embrace this life that we have in Jesus? We serve others. We follow the example of Jesus who came not to be served, but to serve. And here's what the promise we have in Luke 9, 24. For whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. As you give up your life for the kingdom of God, you experience the life that only he can bring. So that's how you can embrace the life that you have in Christ. How do you follow Jesus? You desire more of him, you make him your all, and you embrace your new life and him. That answers part of the question of how we follow him. But I had this question as I was working through this passage. But what about people asking, why, why should I desire more of Jesus? That, that's a legitimate question. Matthew records uh, the Sermon on the Mount is what it's called. It's one of the messages of Jesus. And here's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Why do we need more of Jesus? Because when you put him first in your life, he takes care of everything else. That's simply the way it works. That's not to say that your life will be trouble-free. In fact, I promise you it won't. We see that in Scripture. Jesus says, in this life you will face troubles. In this life you will have storms. But if you have Jesus at the center of your life, you get to stand upon the rock where you can be firm in who you are in Christ. And you can face those storms in ways that you could never hope to do without Jesus in your life. I'm going to invite you to stand as we close in song this morning. And as you're standing, I would like to ask, maybe you're here today and you've never centered your life on Jesus. You, you've never desired him to be Lord of all. Maybe you haven't even understood your need of a savior. But let me encourage you today, you need a savior. You first have to recognize I need help and I can't help myself. So if you're here today and you say, you know what? I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to accept the invitation that he gives us to follow him. With every head bowed here this morning, we just want to take a moment to pray with you. So if that would be you today and you'd say, you know what? I want to surrender my life to him. I want to follow him. I see that invitation and I want to choose him today to say yes to Jesus. Simply raise your hand. And we want to pray with you before we go today. Anybody here today and say, yes, that's me. I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow in the, the path that he has for me. I want to surrender my life to him. Anybody here today that would say, that's me. I want to follow Jesus. I want to pray with you today, and then we're going to close in song. Lord Jesus, we just ask that you would continue to impress upon the hearts and lives of everyone in this room our need of you daily. Lord, even if we've surrendered our life to you, maybe there's things in our life that we fully have not committed to you. May we do that today. May we hold nothing back. Lord, we don't want a, a patch. We want a whole new garment. And so, God, I pray that you would give that today. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give new garments to people today that have only taken a patch up to this point. And, Lord, I pray that if there's somebody in this room that hasn't committed their life to you, I pray that they would, as we sing today, have a desire to do that before they leave. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.